So, what did they see? Well, the LIGO detectors made their first detection of a clear, unambiguous gravity wave signal from space on the 14th of September 2015, which was published in a paper with quite a few authors. That's the way science works these days. It's very large teams. Now remember, what they were expecting to see is the chirp, the in-spiral of two compact objects, black holes, neutron stars, something like that. So the idea is you get your two objects, and as they normally rotate around, they're emitting a steady sine wave, but you're not going to see that with LIGO at the current level of sensitivity. But as they get closer and closer together, just in the last few seconds before they merge, they'll be going faster and faster around each other. The acceleration will be bigger and bigger, so you should get a signal that's getting faster and faster and stronger and stronger, and then it rings down to nothing. So the black hole separation goes down until they're only one Schwarzschild radius apart, and the relative velocity goes up until they're travelling at 60-70% you know, of the speed of light just before merging. And that is indeed what was seen. Here is the very first set of data for this gravity wave burst. Now at the bottom we have a diagram showing time, so 0.05 of a second per interval here, against the frequency. And here is the actual signal. So what you can see is not very much over here. Then you're picking up a signal down here at a frequency that's quite low, and then it runs up, becomes much stronger to a higher frequency, and then disappears. And the same thing was seen from Hanford, Washington, and Livingstone, Louisiana, which rules out most forms of interference. You know, someone like reversing a truck outside is not going to affect two different um, buildings on opposite sides of the United States. And here's the actual data. You can just see the general noise pattern, and then you start seeing a bigger oscillation. The period gets shorter and shorter, the amplitude gets higher and higher, then it damps down to nothing. And if you overlie that, Shifted it upside down on top of the data from Livingstone, you see that the pattern of the two of them agrees very well, with a bit of shift because it takes a tiny fraction of a second to get from one to the other. And that slight delay helps you work out where in the sky the signal is coming from. And now you can compare these signals to the models. This is a model using general relativity of what should happen when, in this case, two black holes merge. And this is the difference, the residual, between the data and the model. And you can see nothing more than just noise there. So the model, based on general relativity, is an extremely good fit to the data. Now since then, there have been three observing runs, um, and quite a few sources have been discovered. Now the exact count is a bit ambivalent, because there are signals that are very clear, and there are signals that are slightly less clear, and then there are signals that are really digging in the noise, many of which are probably still real, but hard to say anything with. But here's a bunch of the clearest signals, and in all cases you can see the same pattern. Low frequency racing up to high frequency and getting more intense. Low frequency racing up to high frequency, and so on and so forth. And here's the actual signal. A steady low oscillation, getting bigger amplitude and faster and faster. And nearly all the cases, these seems to correspond to two black holes merging. But there have been a couple of cases where it's much smaller things, binary neutron stars. We're not going to talk about them here. Uh, we talked about them in the Great Sons of Mysteries part of the course, this particular one, the first binary neutron star event. So go back there and have a look. Now we can actually play the sound signal we get here. So here we're going to do a look at the signal, the time before the neutron star merger. Only noise so far, but now you begin to see the signal. Rising in frequency. Sound that 
was the chirp. This particular one is a signal from the binary neutron star, but you get a similar signal from the merging black holes. Here is a recent event seen last year in the third run. In this case, it's a merger of another merger of two black holes, and this one was detected by both LIGO detectors and just about by the European Virgo detector, which is a bit less sensitive but still saw something enough to get some sort of triangulation. So you see rising here, much more clear rising there, and just about there. You probably wouldn't trust it if this is all you saw, but the fact that it coincides with this and this means it's probably reliable and realistic. And here again is a detailed model fit. So we're looking at the detector data compared to the model, and once again they do an extraordinarily good job. Here is a simulation of the uh, gravity waves being emitted in this particular case. So we've got our two black holes moving around their common centre of mass, and all the coloured patterns are showing the distortions of space and time, which are the gravity waves moving away from them. Quite a beautiful pattern, really. And you can see there's a zoom in on the corner on the right. You can see the pattern radiating out, the gravity waves disappearing off into space, which we're picking up from the Earth. As they get closer and closer together, the frequency gets shorter. They're going faster and faster, getting closer and closer to the speed of light, closer and closer to a Schwarzschild radius. And the intensity becomes stronger, the stronger and stronger th the gravity waves coming out. Now they're starting to, starting to distort each other's event horizons as they get very, very close. Then it merges and rings down and goes quiet. And all you have is this rapidly spinning larger black hole. Now here are the events detected by the gravity wave detectors from the first and second runs. This is the timeline Blue showing when it was actually on and working. And it shows the distance in megaparsecs out to where these things came from. And you can see there's the merging neutron stars, which is very close, but the other sources, the merging black holes, are out to staggering distances, like nearly 3 gigaparsecs, that's nine, nearly 10 billion light years away. So these are coming from cosmological dif distances, very large distances. You can work out the distance they come from actually by looking at that graph of oscillation versus time, because this is a very well understood signal. If you know the mass and the frequency, you can work out the period and the luminosity. So these are, in some sense, natural standard candles. What has been seen? Well, this is perhaps the biggest surprise. Before the uh, first gravity waves were discovered, I think most people expected you'd mostly be seeing the effect from merging neutron stars. Now the yellow dots in this diagram are the neutron stars, their masses, as found in the electromagnetic spectrum by conventional astronomy. And the one and only, well at the time of writing this, this is slightly out of date, but back then there was just one merging pair of neutron stars, and it was two things here with just over one solar mass merging to form something just over two solar masses. But then we get to the black holes where there's more of a surprise. The purple marks are the masses of the black holes that have been detected by various optical astronomy techniques that we've already been talking about, whereas the blue are the black hole mergers. So the ones down the bottom are the two that merge to form the one at the top. These two merge to form that one. These two merge to form that one. And what you can see is pretty much all the black holes previously known were 15 solar masses or less. But these new ones, I mean, a few of them are about the same, but a lot of them are much bigger. You're talking 20, 30 solar masses to begin with, ending up as high as 80 solar masses to end up with. So the black holes we're finding through this merger process are much bigger than the black holes we knew about already. Now, so far we've only talked about the gravity wave data, but there's a lot of excitement about the possibility of finding these gravity wave bursts at other wavelengths using the electromagnetic spectrum with which we're more familiar. 
Now from the LIGO and Virgo data you get some idea of where the source is coming from. Basically you can triangulate and measure when the, gra the gravity wave burst arrives at each telescope and if it arrives sooner at one than another that's telling you it's coming from the direction of that particular telescope. This is not very accurate. Here for example are sky plots showing the area on the sky that four particular bursts came from. So the yellow indicates high probability and the fainter red indicates low probability. So typically you find long streaks and often streaks on different parts of the sky or multiple streaks depending on which of the three detectors actually saw it, what the relative timing was. So it's not a question of gravity wave burst came from coordinates 2138 minus 4434, point the telescope there. You have to map a large area of the sky and hope that there's something really obvious that it's coming from. Some of our own telescopes up at the, uh, the ANU Siding Spring Observatory are very good for that. This is a sky mapper telescope, which has a very wide field of view, so it's good for mapping the enormous areas of the sky uh, to search for the whole possible region where the thing may have gone off. Then you have to compare that with existing data for that large area of the sky and look for something that's changed, a new flash or something that's changed colour, something that might be a sign that there was an actual burst. If you then identify it, you can go to narrower field telescopes like this, which is the uh, 2.3 metre telescope at Siding Spring Observatory, and follow up and get spectra. So in the early days, whenever a gra gravity wave burst went off, there was a huge flurry of activity as telescopes, optical telescopes, infrared telescopes, radio telescopes, all the electromagnetic telescopes in the world slewed around to look at it. Unfortunately, in most cases, nothing was seen. The one exception is the binary neutron star system, and that was pinned down partly because it also had a gamma ray burst associated with it, and that's discussed in the first course in the series. But for the black hole black hole collisions, no one has been able to actually see any electromagnetic radiation coming from a, a flash somewhere in the region of the sky at the right time. And maybe that's because our telescopes are not sensitive enough, or we're not getting onto the right patch of the sky quickly enough. But it could well be just that when two black holes merge, there is no explosion, no flash. All the light is just swallowed by the black hole, so there is actually nothing to see at electromagnetic wavelengths.